welcome, welcome to episode one of Dielectric Videos. So in this episode, we are going to talk about isolation transformers, why you need an isolation transformer, why you might not need an isolation transformer, and if you are an electronics enthusiast, why isolation transformers are super helpful. So here goes. In order to kind of understand the purpose and function of an isolation transformer, I should first describe how a transformer works. Now the symbol for a transformer in an electronic schematic would be something like this. Coils of wire going in, coils of wire going out, and these dividers which represent a magnetic core in between these coils. Now as you can see, there's no electronic connection between these two coils whatsoever uh, in this, in this uh, schematic symbol, and normally in actual implementation of transformers there isn't either. I'll talk about the special case of an auto transformer, also called a buck transformer, later on. However, uh, the fundamentals of a transformer are that you have a primary and a secondary winding, and sometimes you have even more windings, but basically the primary winding is where you put in an AC signal, and the secondary winding is where you get an AC signal out, but usually at a different voltage. Now, it has to be alternating current, because if you have direct current going into a transformer, uh, it'll build up a magnetic field and never collapse it, meaning no power will come out of the other side. Now that's because the basis for a transformer's operation is a changing magnetic flux in the core of the transformer that's set up and collapsed over and over and over again by a changing input voltage. Now it just so happens that the number of turns of winding around the core on each side has a proportionate effect on the ratio between the input voltage and the output voltage. And it also has a proportionate effect on the input current and output current, which would be inversely proportional. So, I'll give you an example. Let's just say I have a transformer with, say, four windings on the input side, and say there are eight windings on the output side. And let's say I put in a voltage of 10 volts AC into this side. Well, it's going to repeatedly increase and decrease the magnetic field and basically turn this core's magnetic field on and off and on and off over and over again at whatever the frequency is of this alternating current. But since there's twice the number of coils here, there's two times that number, and there's only one times that original number of coils on the primary, the voltage is actually going to get doubled because effectively you have coils in series. And when you have these coils in series, your voltage doubles. So if you have 10 volts AC going in, you're going to get 20 volts of AC out. And it's going to be at the same frequency, but what is going to be different about it is the current. Now in an ideal transformer, there's no loss of power regardless of the ratio of turns. So let's say you were drawing one amp at 20 volts off of this side, and that's your load. Well, the transformer, assuming it hasn't been saturated, which is a problem I'll describe later, it's going to draw double that current because there's only half the voltage, so it's going to draw two amps. And that is because current or power is conserved. 1 amp at 20 volts, 1 times 20 would be 20 watts. And on the other side, 20 watts is, of course, power time, or voltage times current, and 10 volts times x, and x would also have to equal 20 or uh, tw this has to equal 20 watts, therefore x has to be 2 amps. So now that you understand the, uh, you can probably now that you understand the basic function of a transformer, and of course I haven't gone very far into the specifics of how the magnetic field works. You can understand why there's a huge advantage to using transformers as voltage changing devices. An example of this, of course, is the power company. They ha might have a generator, and this is a very small generator uh, drawing, and it might be hooked up to some kind of steam turbine and the turbine is spinning the generator, and let's say you're getting, oh, I don't know, say you're getting, uh, well, we'll arbitrarily say this is a small, tiny little power plant, and you're getting 240 volts out of it. Well, to distribute that, you might want to step that up to, say, 7,200 volts, because if you, as you know, uh, the more current you have running through a wire, the more it heats up and the more energy you lose. And to compensate that, to transfer the same amount of power under the power equals voltage times current law, you're going to want to drop the amperage and increase the voltage to trans transmit the same amount of power. So what you want to do is send this 240 volts into a transformer, 
which uh, I'll just draw here. Uh, what you'd probably be more familiar with is the big pad mounted thing that sits on a concrete pad, has a little handle on it, and probably says do not enter. Uh, this essentially changes voltage up and down. So you might then have uh, 7200 volts coming out. Of course, this is a gross uh, kind of simplification of this. Uh, usually there's three phases, and usually this, the transformers in substations don't look like this, but this is what you might be familiar with for a transformer. You also might be familiar with the kind that's on top of a telephone pole mounted to the side of it like this, and usually connected with some other cables that go to your house and to your electrical panel. This does the same thing, except this takes the 7200 volts, or whatever it is, and drops the voltage at the expense of increasing the current, which is what you want for your house, because you don't want extremely high voltage in your house. 7200 volts at your outlet would uh, potentially jump out, potentially short across wires. Of course, your electronics aren't designed to run on that either. Uh, it's what you end up doing is uh, s transforming this down to a split circuit of 120 volts and another 120 volts. This is called a split single phase. It's one of the more common applications of, uh, of mains power in the United States. And of course, since these are actually from a center tap on the transformer, which would essentially, if you're up here looking at this transformer, a center tap would be in the middle. Uh, if you have the center tap, you get 120 volts on each side, which lets you then run 240 volts for the big stuff like your air conditioner, your heat pump, your dryer, all that kind of stuff. So you understand now the purpose, application, and usefulness of transformers. So now we get to talk about the isolation transformer. So I'll write isolation. And I'll just abbreviate this as XFMR. A lot of people in the industry like to use XFMR because it's easier to write out than transformer. So here's the basis as far as the safety applications of an isolation transformer. And there are a lot of pros and cons between using a GFCI, a ground fault circuit interrupter, versus an isolation transformer. So basically, let's say we have uh, some guy here and he is standing in a puddle of water on a concrete floor and this concrete floor just so happens to be sitting on a rather damp patch of earth underneath now over his electrical distribution panel in his house where you probably have the power company's meter and then this goes up to your uh, to your weather head and you've got your circuit breakers and everything else uh, that you'd have in a main panel. Well, it's going to have a ground rod driven into the ground to reference the panel and the ground of the panel to the ground voltage. So it's referenced to whatever the voltage is in, uh, at the ground. This is a safety feature to make sure that when you have an earthing conductor uh, coming out of your panel and going to, say, the outside of your refrigerator. Uh, I'm going to draw a really bad refrigerator here. It's to make sure that your refrigerator doesn't suddenly go to a different voltage with respect to the ground and shock someone there. Now, here's the problem. If something goes wrong, and say that plugged into the wall here is a, let's say you are standing in this puddle and you're operating an electric drill. So this isn't a very good drawing of an electric drill, but you get the idea. And let's say it's, it's plugged in with a two-prong cord with no grounding conductor, and it's one of those really old ones with the metal. And it's all like, you can see the old exposed metal. The cord is all frayed at the bottom, sort of like my Electropup, as I showed in the previous video. And all at once, the hot conductor, which is the one that's referenced to the high side of the transformer up on the pole, which uh, would of course be one of these two legs connected to this drill, all at once now the drill becomes live. Now that's not really a big issue as far as the uh, the drill can, is concerned. It'll just keep running all at once. But for the guy ha uh, handling it, suddenly this would go up to 120 volts. And this concrete slab, which is an ionic substrate and kind of conducts a little bit of electricity with the puddle on it, is suddenly still, well it's not suddenly, it's still referenced to ground. These are still connected together by a weak connection. Now you have 120 volts here, 0 volts here. The guy 
is going to have his is going to be fried. Well, not fried, but he's going to be given a pretty bad shock by his drill. This is a really bad thing because as I'll probably cover in a later video about electrical safety, having electrical current going across your heart or across your chest can do really bad stuff. It doesn't uh, it depends also on the current, but it can cause uh, it can cause death in the most severe cases. So you really don't want that to happen. Now, why do we want an isolation transformer? Well, for this very reason. And as I mentioned in the other uh, previous page here, there is no, unless it's an auto transformer, which is a transformer in which one connection is wired in series to the other to give you a higher voltage gain. If, unless it's wired like that, there shouldn't be any connection between the primary and the secondary in a properly functioning transformer. So, if we were to use a, an isolation transformer, this would be connected to the outlet up here. Let's just draw a cable up to there. Now this is basically what would be inside here. Now if you want the same voltage, you would have the same number of turns connected here. So this would have a one-to-one -one ratio, and the output voltage would be the same as the input voltage. However, there would be no direct path between either one of these and Earth. Which means if this guy's drill was plugged into here instead, well then, when the cord frays and shorts to the case, it still goes up to 120 volts with respect to the transformer's neutral. Uh, if we say this is the hot and this is the neutral. However, this neutral is not connected to Earth at any point, meaning that the guy no longer gets electrocuted by it. It makes the drill a lot safer to use. Now that's not to say there isn't a hazard if, say, the guy was holding onto the cord and there was another broken spot, and then it could go across and still ha have him uh, have a problem because any time that there is voltage across the hot and the neutral, there's still a hazard. But it makes it a lot safer because no, you no longer have that reference potential to earth ground, and that is essentially what makes isolation transformers a good tool to have if you're going to be working with mains voltage in your experiments. So if you're going to be building something like you probably saw in my introduction, the uh, burning paper, that was driven off uh, an isolation transformer hooked directly to mains. I was actually using a, a resistive element in series, but had that been directly connected to mains, I would have been at pretty severe risk of getting a shock when I went to adjust the position of the wires. With the isolation transformer, however, there's no potential across the uh, primary and secondary uh, connections of the transformer, and thus no potential between earth ground, which is the real ground, and the transformer's neutral ground, which is the pseudo ground. So with that in mind, it's a safer situation. Um, it's important to note some transformers, like I said, have one side wired to the other so that when you have current flowing through here, now this isn't exactly how they would wire it, when you have current flowing through here and flowing through here, the voltage between this, uh, or this point and this point rather, would be double the voltage across the rest of the transformer. That's called an auto transformer or a buck transformer configuration. However, it's not applicable to isolation transformers. Isolation transformers are fully dielectrically isolated and don't have any links between the input primary and the output secondary. So, if you're interested in more about isolation transformers, you can check out my next video where I'm showing the one that I built from an old voltage step-up, step-down transformer. So, as always, uh, there might have been errors in this, so beware and take it with a grain of salt. But I'm hoping this gave some insight as to how transformers work, how isolation transformers work, and why you might want one. Um, I'll also do another uh, video when I'm talking about my bigger isolation transformer uh, regarding whether GFCIs are preferable or whether transformers are preferable and for what applications. So thank you for watching Dielectric Videos, and I will see you next time.